morning oh good afternoon good evening wherever you are joining us today uh you're very welcome to this uh seminar webinar from the migration policy center of the european university institute in florence my name is andrew geddes i'm going to chair this uh meeting uh and very happy to welcome today dr federico alagna who's a postdoctoral researcher at the scuola normale superiore here in florence uh he's uh, presenting a paper on civil society and municipal activism around migration in the European Union, looking at alliance making from a multi-scale perspective. How we will organise this is Federico will speak for around half an hour, uh, and then we'll have around half an hour for questions and discussion. Uh, those questions can be from people here in the room, also from people joining us online. For people who are joining us online, you're very welcome to join the discussion but you would need to do so through the chat box on YouTube. As I say, you're very welcome to join, but it would need to be via the chat box on YouTube. So without further ado, very happy to welcome Federico and, and hand over. Thank you, Andrew, and um, good morning, uh, afternoon, evening, <laughs> everyone. And um, thanks to the MPC for having me here. I am I'm really uh, happy to, uh, to be here and to have the opportunity of presenting this uh, um, work of mine and uh, to, to discuss it with you, I think, uh, and I hope, but I'm sure I would say, it would be really uh, inspiring for, for me also to, um, to hear what you think about it and uh, to get your feedback on it. Um, I am uh, like the work I'm presenting today is part of, uh, of the project I'm currently working on at Scuola Normale, which is a um, broader project. It's a Jamone network on transnational political contention in Europe, uh, TRAPOCO, that's uh, the acronym of the project, uh, which is led by Scuola Normale. It's um, uh, coordinated by uh, Donatella della Porta and uh, uh, it is exploring actually the interaction between uh, uh, political contention and uh, uh, European integration. Uh, our part of the of the um, of the research has to do with uh, transnational political uh, contention in the uh, migration field. What I'm going to present here today is uh, uh, part of the of the of this research and uh, some of the first uh, um, insights that we had on on uh, uh, political contention in the European context. Um, okay, well, let's do it this way. So the um, impetus for this project, so the, the idea uh, that uh, um, made us start working on, uh, uh, on this came from this uh, um, understanding we had, I mean, having a look at uh, how um, migration governance works in the EU, so uh, looking at, at it, we, we realized uh, that on the one hand, uh, so we had uh, an increased uh, executivization of policies and of politics. So uh, an increased role of uh, governments, of national governments, of the Council of the EU. But on the other hand, we also saw in different ways and in more hidden ways somehow, uh, an increased role also of other actors, unusual suspects, so to speak, and among them, we particularly focus on two of these actors. So civil society actors in a very broad definition, so not only uh, social movement actors, but also NGOs and, uh, and other, other actors that can be comprised within this broad definition of civil society, also taking uh, into account uh, the difficulty of uh, uh, you know, just drawing a line between one and uh, the other, in this increased hybridization of, uh, of actors. And on the other hand, we also looked at municipalities as uh, cities and their increased role in uh, migration governance. And in particular, we started looking at the interaction uh, between one another. So, I mean, how uh, civil society actors and municipalities were uh, talked to, to, to each other, were trying to, to work together uh, with a view to, uh, to influencing uh, um, um, EU migration governance. Uh, this uh, approach is not uh, new in itself. I mean, the, there has been uh, some work going on, especially in the last few years, uh, on, these, uh, uh, on these aspects. And uh, what we particularly found it was uh, somehow missing was uh, 
uh, looking not at uh, the, the broad field of interactions that may happen between these two actors, but specifically focusing on those forms of uh, interaction that are more stable, structured. So forms of cooperation that are not uh, uh, spot and not just for one occasion of one campaign, but are more uh, structured over time. So the, this part of the, of the research and the, the piece of research I'm presenting here today essentially deals with this question. So try, tries to understand how these forms of more structured cooperation takes place and what are the, the factors that influence uh, uh, it. To do so, I uh, to try to, to give an answer to this, uh, to this question, I decided to focus on uh, um, one specific case, it's a case study, which is this uh, dual network called uh, From the Sea to the City and the International Alliance of Safe Harbors. I mean, it's, uh, it's as, you, as I define it, it's a dual network, meaning that, uh, uh, as we will see, From the Sea to the City is a network comprising several civil society organizations, the International Alliance of Safe Harbors is a network comprising different uh, municipalities across Europe. The point is that uh, rather than treating these as two separate networks, they, are, they actually are one single network for a simple reason, that uh, the International Alliance of, of Safe Harbors, EASH in a, in a word, uh, is actually uh, the result of uh, the uh, activity uh, of uh, from the city to the city. It's uh, uh, actually all the municipalities that engaged in this alliance were mobilized somehow by uh, civil society actors and the political coordination and steering somehow of this uh, uh, city network is in the hands of from the city to the city. That's why in a way it's just uh, uh, a dual network, but with one political uh, direction. Just to give you a, a very uh, quick idea of uh, what we're talking about, uh, I just want to uh, at least go very quickly through the organizations that uh, compose from the city to the city. What is important here is just to focus on a, a couple of aspects. I think the first one is the diversity of these organizations, because we have uh, um, um, organizations active in search and rescue at sea, organizations that are more, uh, more working on uh, um, uh, borders, organizations that are uh, more engaged in, uh, in policy actions, even think tanks. So it's a very uh, uh, heterogeneous network, so to speak. The second aspect which is interesting is the operational scale of these uh, different organizations, because uh, we can see that it's quite uh, uh, spread across Europe. And the third aspect that is really interesting is the target scale of these organizations. So regardless of where they are based, these organizations all share in terms of policy action, in terms of advocacy uh, work, the uh, um, that target I mean on, on the European Union policy. So it's not, uh, we're not talking about organizations that are trying to influence local poli policies, but we're talking about organizations that always have this uh, EU uh, target in mind. As for the uh, International Alliance of Safe Harbors, EASH, uh, you can see that it's, uh, again, somehow widespread across Europe uh, with a very big presence of, uh, of Germany in it, uh, uh, but also I mean other, uh, other cities uh, uh, across Europe, some of them very symbolic now, as Lampedusa or Pozzallo could be. Uh, and other cities uh, like Barcelona, for example, or Palermo itself that are um, actually more, uh, that have become very relevant actors in, uh, in the EU uh, uh, migration politics in terms of uh, uh, advocacy and uh, uh, try, I mean, the, the attempts at uh, influencing the public debate. Having said that, so focusing on this uh, single case uh, uh, from city to the city, uh, EASH, uh, what I um, try to uh, understand is exactly I mean, the, the, which are the, the factors that explain the emergence of this multi-scale alliance between uh, uh, cities and municipalities around migration. It's multi-scale alliance, of course, because we have organizations based at different, uh, uh, different levels. It's spread across the EU. Uh, it's a research that, uh, uh, as such, I mean, tries also to, to combine different uh, uh, approaches in order to understand what is uh, what is going on. Because on the one hand, uh, it is uh, it tries to, uh, to to engage with existing uh, scholarship in European studies. So uh, we we talk specifically about uh, uh, migration governance in the EU. So. The risk is this, uh, uh, this attempt at understanding uh, the, the agency of these two uh, actors within a broader settings of interaction 
uh, in the migration governance of the European Union. But on the other hand, it's uh, very much influenced, of course, also uh, by social movement and contentious politics studies. In a way, the uh, the, the the contact point, I mean, the the the, the moment in which these two uh, two two strands get in touch is uh, with a concept also of Europeanization from below, from uh, Donatella della Porta and Manuela Cagliani. Um, the focus, uh, as said, is on this case study. Uh, the, it's a qualitative study based essentially on uh, two types of sources, semi-structured interviews with, with um, uh, from city to city activists, uh, policy officials, um, uh, researchers, and uh, uh, practitioners more broadly, and desk research, uh, which uh, essentially took into account uh, official documents of these two networks, uh, um, uh, blog posts, uh, journal articles, um, sorry, newspaper articles, and uh, uh, more broadly, I mean, other uh, related, uh, related documents. Uh, the um, framework that I try to use uh, to, um, to understand this, uh, uh, this alliance uh, uh, is, um, is based on um, the, the attempted at understanding the agency of these actors in the context in which it takes place. So, I mean, if we talk, uh, uh, I mean, if we get in the perspective of European studies, of course, I mean, the classic point of reference would be an institutionalist approach like very, very classic one, meaning trying to understand the interaction between the, the agency of actors and the context in which uh, this takes place. Uh, of course, if we look at it from a social movement uh, studies perspective, we more, uh, I mean, we, we move more towards a political opportunity approach. So understanding essentially how the two, uh, how the civil society actors try to, see, try to seize opportunities and to cope with the constraints that they find in the institutional environment in which they move. I think just one aspect which is important to understand also for um, people who are not familiar with uh, um, these, uh, like with, with social movement scholarship, is also the difference between fixed and dynamic opportunities that social movement or civil society organizations deal with. I think this is important because uh, in the context in, uh, uh, in which, uh, I mean, the, 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 that I studied, there is a lot of difference between those opportunities and constraints that are in a way intrinsic to the uh, to migration governance, our long-term opportunities or constraints, are uh, situations that are fixed somehow, and uh, other dynamic opportunities that are in, instead more related to contingent factors, to changing configurations of power, to uh, exact moments in which some opportunities opened or some constraints appeared and then subsequently closed uh, shortly afterwards. So this is a concept that I will also uh, use in, uh, in my research. Applying these, all this framework, all these uh, uh, elements that we talked about to the case at hand, uh, uh, I tried to develop an analytical model based on, uh, sorry, I was just moving away from the mic, an analytical model which uh, um, uh, was first elaborated by, by uh, Raffaele Basurli, and then I tried to elaborate it for uh, the sake of this, of this research. So I'll try to, to guide you through, through that also to understand how the uh, the research uh, evolved. So then looking at this model from the left to the right, so the, the, the main uh, the starting point is understanding of uh, these, uh, uh, like the, the governance of migration in the EU as a, a setting of multi-level governance, in which there are several migration-related issues of different aspects that uh, influence and uh, talk somehow, speak to civil society actors on the one hand and city governments to the other hand. And so there is this attempt from these two actors, this attempt or this necessity also, depending on the, on the specific situation of dealing with these inputs coming from the migration field. For different reasons, depending on that and in different ways, depending on the specific characteristics, these actors tend to try to address upper policy arenas, such as the EU uh, arena and the national arena, trying to bring forward, to put forward the uh, demands, the needs, the points of view. What happens is that this process of uh, uh, information sharing, this process also of advocacy, depending on the on how we want to, to frame it and how we look at it, uh, gets stopped at a certain point. It's not successful. There are some constraints that uh, uh, make, make this uh, communication process uh, uh, impossible to work. 
I mean, uh, impossible or difficult to uh, to realize. This is the moment in which the two actors, civil society and uh, city governments, uh, make a move, so to speak. So there is this uh, downward scale shift from civil society actors who go local in a way. So they find this uh, uh, communication channel with upper police arenas blocked. So they go down, they go local. Whereas city governments, looking also at this uh, uh, scale shift of civil society actors, decide to engage in a communication and talk with them. And this is where local alliances take place and where this communication, this stable communication between, two, between these two actors takes place. From this, a third uh, movement takes place, which is from, local, from the um, configuration and from the establishment of, the, of these local alliances, there is a third movement towards back towards upper police arenas. And so in a way, city governments and civil society actors, actors try to bypass the constraints they find in the communication channel towards upper police arenas, working on local alliances and then getting back to, through this transnationalization to the upper policy arenas. This is the model. This is how I uh, try to analyze this, uh, um, the, the, this uh, establishment, I mean, this uh, emergence of, uh, uh, of um, uh, CT and CSA's uh, alliances. What I try to do in, uh, in the research I'm presenting here today is trying to uh, understanding, I mean, to answer to some why questions related to these three arrows. I mean, why this uh, downward scale shift takes place, why cities engage, and why once this engagement has taken place, they go back to the transnational level. So in a way we, we can um, imagine that the first, I mean, the main research question that I presented before as uh, unpacked into these uh, three different uh, research sub-questions. What I'm going to do now in these uh, 10 minutes we, we have left, I guess, uh, it's to uh, trying to share with you the findings that I uh, uh, collected, like related to these three uh, sub-questions and then to uh, present some uh, conclusions and uh, uh, based on, uh, on these findings. Uh, starting with the first uh, uh, arrow, so the first sub question, so why this uh, downward scale shift of civil society organizations takes place, so why these organizations move to the local level? I found that uh, there is uh, a, a, a double process. On the one hand, there is a, a closure of political opportunities of action for them at the European and national level. This is in a way, on, on one hand, based on some fixed constraints, such as a structural inaccessibility of uh, institutions, especially of the Council of the EU for them. So in terms of having arenas where they can try to influence the, the policy process, to have the voices heard and to put forward I mean, all the, the issues they're working on. In this broader context, which is uh, in a way inherent to the, the, the uh, EU governance system, there are some dynamic um, elements that further increased uh, this difficulty uh, civil society actors found in interacting with EU institutions. And this essentially has to do with this increased repressive and restrictive approach to migration that followed that so-called 2014-15 refugee crisis. And third element, it's uh, the strong mistrust that civil society organizations had related to this process of engaging with a, a policy dialogue with the EU. This means that besides the actual existence of fixed and dynamic uh, opportunities or constraints of engaging with the EU system, uh, talking with civil society actors, uh, understanding and analyzing the policy documents, it becomes clear that uh, there is a mistrust. So they, they don't see any opportunity. This is a, a clear understanding they had. And so, this further increase, I mean, the, the, the fact that uh, there was this perception was as such a constraint towards their action, their agency at, uh, uh, in, in engaging with, uh, with the EU. This, is, this on the one hand explains why, I mean, the process is blocked somehow in uh, engaging directly with the EU and with the national governments. But why local? I mean, why there is this movement to the towards uh, the, the local scale? This happens uh, essentially because of dynamic opportunities. Uh, it happens because uh, at a certain point, uh, cities become uh, keen to engage. They show, they, they reach out to municipal, to um, civil society actors. They show their willingness to engage with them in some uh, migration-related works. 
there is a, a, a strong impact also in certain uh, spaces, in certain political spaces, especially in Spain, of the municipalist, the municipalist wave, the new municipalist wave that had taken place, that, that had started just a couple of years before. And uh, um, um, also remarkably, within civil society organizations, uh, there was also a decisive role played by certain actors in terms of procurage uh, that uh, uh, due to their political culture, due to their uh, also personal history, were pushing a lot towards uh, this uh, uh, local uh, engagement of um, civil society actors. So there were key persons that, for example, in the course of my research came out, I mean, their names came out like very, very often, that oriented somehow the, the, the action of many, many uh, different uh, initiatives across Europe towards the local level. Then why cities engaged? That's the, the, second, uh, the second part, uh, the second question that I, that I try to, to address. And, and here there are different factors. I mean, for the sake of time, I'm not going through all of them, but I would like just to, to mention it to go into more uh, depth uh, regarding uh, some of them. First of all, the, the first uh, aspect that I highlight uh, in terms of institutional factors. So the fact that uh, uh, in uh, approaching civil society organizations, working for a change of uh, uh, EU migration policy, Cities were actually engaging in a policy arena which was different from the local one. I mean, they were not uh, they were not the recipient of uh, uh, of advocacy. They were not the recipients of requests for policy change. They were part of the advocacy work. They were trying to influence another policy arena in which they had, at least formally, but also substantively, from certain points of view no direct responsibility. This, in a way, uh, made this engagement for cities costless or almost them. Of course, there were some reputational costs for, for certain cities in particular, from some political costs that were uh, to, uh, to be sustained, but uh, they were uh, in a way uh, relative, uh, uh, relatively less compared to the political gain they, um, they, could, uh, they could have by, uh, from, from this engagement. So the fact that we were not talking about integration policies, we were not talking about reception policies, but we're talking about border policies, immigration policy, more broadly. So where city said no direct impact, this made their engagement easier with, um, uh, in comparison with other, uh, with other domains within the, the migration field. Another aspect which I would like to, to mention uh, uh, regarding the engagement of cities is the last one, uh, regarding the, the agency of cities because uh, there was also a clear perception, this was also a perception that certain civil society actors had very clearly, that uh, in a way the engagement of cities could also favor uh, the, um, uh, the overcome of some local challenges that very city governments were experiencing. An example was that of cities that uh, were struggling with uh, uh, social movement organizations in the city or um, other civil society actors, uh, um, urging them to implement a better reception system or uh, criticizing them, having big political campaigns against the way in which uh, um, um, asylum seekers and migrant people were actually received and services were provided to them in the cities. The engaging in a broader network of migration and showing their active role for uh, promoting a better migration governance in the EU was a way also to shift attention to other issues and uh, to uh, minimize the impact of uh, uh, these local challenges they were experiencing. This is also why um, one, one remarkable element that, that came out in the research is that uh, in this alliance between cities and, uh, um, and civil society actors, local civil society actors stay completely out of the picture. So we are always talking about uh, EU and nationwide actors, but not locally engaged civil society actors. And uh, this is also ex explainable in, in this perspective. Lastly, also because time is running out, uh, um, why once this uh, engagement between cities, this, why, why when this, after this alliance in a way, uh, emergence emerges, uh, why an upward scale shift takes place. So why this uh, uh, alliance between organizations and cities does not stay local, does not remain at a local level, but it goes back to, uh, to a transnational level in this case. 
On the one end, uh, it's uh, a clear reason stays in the fact that uh, if the, the approach, I mean, if the goal, the main goal for this, these uh, two actors, uh, uh, for the interaction between these two actors was that of influencing the uh, uh, influencing migration policy at an EU and the national level, of course, I mean, it, it was necessary in a way to get back uh, to, to, those, uh, to those arenas. But uh, operationally, they could also have tried to remain local and you know, to try to influence that from uh, just a, a local uh, local perspective. So in terms of advocating just from, from the local level without engaging in transnational campaigns, et cetera. The reason why this happened uh, is uh, essentially related to uh, the uh, the last uh, uh, the last element, uh, the opening of transnational political opportunities that I mentioned here in this uh, uh, in this slide. So uh, there was a, a clear understanding within civil society actors that uh, migration as a transnational issue requires a transnational approach. So this was this idea that. Uh, one of the main obstacles in being effective in addressing migration policy for civil society actors was exactly the, the failure to being really transnational vis-a-vis -a, -vis a phenomenon which is transnational per se. Uh, a second element which also uh, became very important was the progressive emergence of uh, transnational uh, arenas of contention. And in this sense, I would like to mention one, especially which is the judicial arena. So the uh, increasing um, opportunities for civil society actors and for cities as well to engage in uh, transnational litigation. Uh, examples can be related to uh, the uh, EU political system. So, I mean, uh, uh, issues in a way related to the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union, but also, uh, national courts became a transnational arena of contention. Just a quick example could be the Salvini trial, which is taking place in Palermo, no? which started uh, uh, with uh, charges pressed by uh, a Spanish organization for something which happened in Italian territorial waters against the former minister of Italy, and in which uh, uh, two cities of different uh, countries, so the city of Barcelona and the city of Palermo, decided to join the trial as civil parties. So, Again, this, this was, for example, uh, uh, I mean, one, was one of the most significant examples of uh, how the judicial arena could become an important place, an important uh, uh, opportunity for uh, um, uh, for a transnational uh, approach. There were also other elements that uh, became uh, relevant, uh, and uh, um, just one that I uh, would like to, to mention in a conclusion is the uh, transnational approach of uh, uh, search and rescue organizations that working in a scale, the Mediterranean Sea, which is transnational by definition, uh, and we also were um, culturally uh, exposed to this uh, transnational approach and were uh, pushing very much forward this uh, transnationalization. So just to uh, focus on some conclusive remarks, uh, and I hope to do so in a couple of minutes, no, no more than that. Uh, the, um, in, in answering the, the research question of, that, I, um, that I put at the, the, the core I mean, of this, uh, this study, uh, in a way, this multi-scale alliance that we, we saw uh, uh, emerging uh, um, between uh, um, civil society and uh, uh, municipal actors was uh, on, on the perspective of civil society, a response to these changing opportunities that were, they were experiencing in the, uh, in the political system. But on the other hand, was also uh, more complex uh, from the perspective of cities because uh, there was, yes, this perception of uh, this uh, role to be fulfilled in terms of uh, being, you know, uh, open cities, open harbors, but there were also more uh, rational uh, uh, oriented approach such uh, this uh, overcome of local challenges uh, and uh, the um, uh, attempt of increasing political gains. This uh, understanding could could be uh, like split into five different points that I'm not sure we have time to go through. I don't know, Andrew, maybe maybe quickly. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, I think, in particular, that uh, uh, what, what we we understand from these uh, uh, from this case is that uh, uh, first of all, we talked a lot about opening and closure uh, processes. These are concurrent, yes, because there were, for example, closure uh, closing political opportunities at the EU level, opening political opportunities at the local one, but they are not necessarily interconnected. This means that uh, in the case at hand, things went 
in this way, but could, could also go in a different way because uh, it is not uh, uh, necessarily true that if we have like problems as civil society actors in addressing the EU level, we will find way at a local level. So this is an, an important um, issue to, uh, to highlight. The second one is that, uh, and which is very much related to the first one, is that uh, um, in the closure of the EU and also national arena, um, fixed opportunities were very relevant. So the system as, it, as it's in itself is uh, problematic for uh, um, uh, for advocacy in the field of migration, whereas opportunities at the local level and partly also in the transnationalization are more dynamic ones. So were more related to the contingent situation civil society was experiencing at that time, which is also uh, in a way worrying from the perspective of civil societies in a future perspective, meaning that it, they might not find uh, uh, new spaces of political action if uh, opportunities close also at the local level. Crucial role of agency perception and interpretation. I already uh, talked about these. Uh, I think it's also important to stress the mixed logic of cities because in most cases, I mean, they were uh, in a way approached in terms of uh, um, you know the properness of their action vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, this uh, idea of being open arbors. There is also uh, uh, an established understanding of uh, the importance of ideological affinity between civil society and cities in promoting uh, a common approach to, to migration, which is true. It's also uh, evident in the case at hand, but there is also, as I was mentioning before, this rational choice approach, which cannot be minimized. And it's also more interesting to understand why certain actors that are not, you know, the champions of uh, uh, at least in terms of perception, of a common perception of uh, um, uh, open migration policy at the local level. There were some cases also in, uh, in IESH. They were still engaged in IESH, even though they, they were not uh, uh, particularly uh, inclined or particularly celebrated by, by civil society initiatives for being uh, you know, very progressive actors. They still engaged in this process and the rational choice approach would actually explain why this happened. And uh, uh, finally, um, getting back to the, I mean, one of the main uh, elements that facilitated the engagement of cities, the fact that we were talking about a different policy arena from the one in which they had the concrete responsibilities. Again, I think uh, this, uh, this case shows us the importance of uh, uh, the target scales of contention, the target scales of advocacy, and how different policy arenas also create different opportunities for these uh, alliance to take place. And if it's true that uh, it was easy somehow to have this alliance taking place in the context of immigration and border policy, this could not be the case uh, uh, if we talk about uh, uh, reception policies uh, or uh, integration policies or other policies in which cities have a more direct uh, responsibility. Thank you very much. Uh, I leave the open question here without commenting on that. Uh, and uh, sorry if I took like five more minutes than necessary. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Federica. That's very interesting. So we, we can now open uh for discussion people in the room and also people online who might have questions feel free to put them into the chat box so first of all i'll see if anybody in the room would like to start the q a uh could you introduce yourself as well you need the microphone please. Great, thanks so much for the presentation i'm uh vicky finn here at the robert schumann center as a max weber fellow um I have a few questions, but I'll keep it just to one. So the you talked about the mistrust or the distrust between um, the civil society organizations towards the EU, but clearly they have to overcome this in some way to then interact with the EU to influence policy. So I was wondering how, um, through your work, how did you find that the alliances with the cities help overcome the distrust or do they shift that somehow um, to then engage? So I was wondering about that factor. And then I guess just a quick question on the research question. Like, why do you focus on the emergency of alliances if you're actually interested in how structured they are? So like the structured interaction, I was wondering why that wasn't more of a focus because at the beginning you said you were interested in that because the emergence, I mean, I feel like is, is a bit more straightforward. They make an alliance, more people, more power, more influence, et cetera. 
So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the structured interactions over time. Thanks. Could I add a couple of questions as well? Uh, one, one thing that struck me as you were speaking was the, uh, that there can be an interest in some of these transnational actors in stimulating engagement with civil society and municipal actors. So, which made me think that the kind of the transnational arena could be maybe more specified in the sense of which actors are you talking about? You mentioned the court, but also the parliament, maybe less receptiveness in the council. I don't know. Uh, uh, the economic and social committee is pretty active around migration issue, but maybe not so powerful. So it was that maybe there is scope for uh, almost like uh, inculcation or sponsorship of these kind of actions through initiatives led by uh, transnational level actors. And also just in terms of the issues on which they focus, uh, because I, I, you talk all about migration, but I, I was wondering if there are specific issues around which they align. So, you know, around, say, border control, border security, but perhaps around, uh, is, uh, does it also relate to debates about integration or also to uh, admissions? What What is the kind of the content? And are, are, is, is there a kind of an, an agreed core? Is there contention about the policy debate? See what I mean? So... Uh, maybe we'll take a third question as well, if you've got room on your page for that, and then we'll take three and then we'll open up again. So we've got uh, Lorenzo, do you, can you introduce yourself for them? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all for uh, for your questions and for for your comments. Um, so, uh, starting with uh, with the first question on the um, distrust that uh, organizations had towards uh, towards the EU, um, I think that uh, like from from my understanding, uh, the um, like working with cities helped in a way uh, was a help minimize this distrust by um, avoiding a direct, a direct approach of civil society organizations towards the EU. So the idea is we don't have enough power. We don't have, we're not held. I mean, if we talk to the EU, we're not held by them. So let cities speak. So th that's the strategic move in a way they, they did. So there is uh, not a distrust in which in absolute terms, meaning uh, they, don't they don't listen to anybody, but they're more likely to, to listen to cities, to a coalition of cities that also represent uh, uh, um, you know, some uh, big numbers, so to speak, also important cities, rather th than to uh, single uh, individual organizations. In this sense, uh, uh, the, uh, I would say that uh, the alliance helped uh, uh, limiting or you know, uh, improving the, 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 the Trust uh, this organization said towards the EU. Of course, I mean, for the sake of brevity, I had to uh, simplify a lot of aspects, but uh, I could say that when I say distrust towards the EU, it's 
quite uh, uh, shared by all the organizations. I think maybe this also addresses part of, uh, of your question, Lorenzo. So uh, uh, it uh, um, uh, it is um, uh, widespread. Uh, there is a widespread distrust towards the Council of the EU and also also the, the European Council. Uh, it's more mixed towards the the Commission. It was very interesting the approach they had to to the to the Parliament. That was really interesting because there were some actors, and uh, yeah, I could I could really see a national divide in these some actors, especially German based, that were very much uh, pushing for a um, increased engagement towards the, the European Parliament. Also because there were some German MEPs that were very inclined to to listen to the uh, to the claims. Whereas other actors, especially uh, French uh, and uh, Italian actors, uh, tended to be more skeptical also towards the, the parliament. So uh, this aspect, uh, uh, so maybe I, I will just connect to the, to the, to the last question now because I, I'm already in the, in the middle of it. So th this aspect is very relevant and it was also very interesting for me during the research and it, it also speaks to the to the open question that I was uh, uh, leaving at the end of, of the presentation so how different this uh, this engagement is uh, among among organizations i i can say this is part of the research is taking place right now and working on right now so trying to to work uh, more deeply into the differences between civil society actors and trying to understand uh why uh, they how they approach differently and why this is the case one explanation was already in your in your question so yes the, the moment in which they joined the process is very much is very much significant so if they were already established before the 2014 15 so called crisis took place they had a certain approach if they uh, joined later they had a completely different approach so this is one one explanation is coming out quite clearly a second explanation is uh, uh, based on the on the um, uh, country they are based, uh, and uh, this is also interesting if we think about uh, this uh, transnationalization effort which is taking place. But then there is this national bias somehow that is uh, still persisting somehow, and so uh, it, it, it can be identified very clearly within the the, the network how German activists uh, tend to share same approach, Italian activists tend to share the same approach. And it's not uh, uh, the, the case that maybe uh, is more interesting in, the, in this respect is that of, civil, of search and rescue organizations, because then you might think they are active transnationally, so they might share the, the same language, the same approach, but this is not the case. And again, also in the, in the approach that search and rescue organizations have within, uh, from the city to the city, they tend to uh, to replicate somehow uh, points connected to the national uh, national identity and then the um, national uh, culture, so more than, than identity. Uh, I think this also uh, this is also connected to the objectives of uh, of the organization. One of the main uh, um, uh, challenges of the network uh, of uh, from city to city EASH network is the lack of clarity towards uh, with respect to, to the objectives of the network. There is a list of objectives. And uh, I, uh, I mean, as uh, you, you were pointing out, Andrew, I mean, I didn't um, talk about them now in the, in the presentation. They are um, related to the border control. They're related to the creation of safe channels towards uh, um, uh, Europe. They are connected to the um, provision of direct funding to cities for migration-related issues, which is also very politically uh, relevant in terms of if there are cities that are willing to, to do more, let them do more, but also let them have the sufficient funds, the sufficient resources to do more. And there is maybe the most uh, characteristic somehow, I mean, the, the, the most topical uh, aspect that they were working on, which is the uh, creation of city to city relocation systems within the uh, the EU which is uh, which of course i mean speaks about uh, city governance but it speaks a lot about uh, i mean the one of the core uh, i mean the, the most contentious issues uh, uh, in uh, in the um, uh, eu migration policy these are the objectives but then uh, i mean the main objectives of the, of the network but of course when it comes to translating these objectives uh, the, like the, this you know this long term strategy into concrete steps to 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 be taken there is the moment in which some tensions also arise and where the differences between the different organizations in terms of the political culture in terms of the moment in which they were established in terms also of their 
main um, uh, the main goal. I mean, the, the main organizational goals is different. Of course, the 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 understanding of an organization which is working on search and rescue at sea is different from the understanding of a, of an organization which is. Uh, working on uh, city-related uh, uh, issues in uh, in a specific country, so uh, I'm not able, in a way, to, to provide a, a conclusive answer on on that. But I think that uh, at least uh, I mean two or three elements that you were mentioning are relevant in understanding also some of the tensions that took place. Uh, I partly touched upon also. Um, the sorry, I'm being very chaotic in this uh, in this response, but I'm trying to to bridging and connecting a bit uh, uh, the different inputs inputs that came. Um, so we, we we talked a lot about the the goals of the of the network, um, uh, which issues they they try to focus on in terms of the uh, transnational uh, engagement of the network. I would like to. I mean, I also partly mentioned the differences between the, the, the different actors that they were um, uh, talking to. I think that uh, from my uh, understanding, one aspect that uh, was really uh, relevant in the research was also this understanding in most cases, in, well, not in most cases, but in, in some cases, that uh, there was this idea of the, the EU as the EU, you know, without really distinguishing between uh, between different actors. When this distinction came out, then there was this, uh, as I was saying, of course, differently the Council, the Commission, and a more mixed uh, approach towards the Parliament. But in some cases, I would say there wasn't even a, a clear understanding on how the EU works and who the real allies could be. I found very um, uh, interesting for the, uh, the the research in itself uh, uh, two of the interviews that I realized with two EU policy officials. That was really interesting, also to because that, uh, an important element which came out is also which opportunities are missed by civil society actors at the transnational level. So they would actually have some opportunities, but they're not able to to see the opportunities that they have. And uh, I think this also uh, this is also very. Uh, very very interesting from um, you know from understanding how to to be more effective in in terms of the advocacy works uh, the advocacy work sorry and going back I think that the only question that I left out is about uh, was this methodological question about why I focused on the, the emergence of these uh, uh, alliance uh, if I want to understand how structure interaction works. Um, Let's say that uh, the, the objective for me, that the, the goal was to understand how a structured organization, a structured um, alliance takes place. So it is interesting for me to see how, what was uh, an initial dialogue between, uh, uh, between actors as uh, take place, I mean, as they take place uh, in, in different situations, in different contexts across Europe, well, across the world, not only across you. I mean, how this was transformed into something more stable, which were the the processes that uh, facilitated this uh, uh, this emergence. In this sense, I um, we took account of uh, all the previous uh, um, communications, the previous engagement that there was between these uh, uh, these actors and uh, city uh, city actors before from the city to the city was. Uh, was created, but when from the city to the city was created, this already had the objective, the, the main goal of becoming a structured alliance. So it was already in the constitutive, constitutive uh, um, nature to say, we want to become an alliance of cities and, uh, uh, and uh, civil society actors. So that's why I'm, I think that understanding how from city to city came out uh, already addresses somehow how a structured interaction takes place. I don't know if this answers your question. I hope I didn't forget. Uh, thank you, um, Federico. My name is Christoph Roos. I'm a visiting fellow from Flensburg University in Germany. Um, I find your research really interesting because it puzzles me a lot. Um, I have um, I, I find it really puzzling that um, uh, um, cities and municipalities cooperate with um, these civil society actors that you mentioned. And I 
would like you to explain a little further uh, what are the politics involved in cooperating with these civil society actors. So um, since we all like, since we know that the median voter is more like interested in having more restrictive immigration policies and a, a municipality also is, a, is, a, is elected. So how does the color of the, of the government or the color of the, the mayor um, respond to the voters in the city? So is that basically um, leftist or like left-leaning governments that you look at that are more likely to cooperate with civil society actors than uh, more conservative governments in cities? And how does this connection with um, the municipality and then the regional or national government work in terms of what runs better or worse if they team up with civil society actors? What is, I, 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 I'm sorry, I still didn't get what their gain actually is. Yes, thank you. Thanks, uh, thank, <clears throat> thanks for, uh, for your question. So um, um, the politics of cooperation. Um, one aspect, I mean, I, I will start telling you something that I would have liked to do and I uh, couldn't do so far. So I think it would be really interesting to see how much of this uh, uh, engagement of uh, municipalities in these networks uh, comes out in the local political debate. I think that would be really interesting because uh, my understanding, which is partly based on, the res on this research, partly on my life <laughs> uh, outside the, the research, is that uh, much of this engagement takes place, I mean, I wouldn't say it's hidden, but uh, it's not very shout, let's say, locally. So it, uh, if I take the case of Palermo, which is one of the cities that is most uh, representative, most symbolic somehow in this network, it's one of the founding cities of the network alongside Potsdam in Germany. Um, the, all the, 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 uh, the, the public uh, declarations, I mean, the, 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 the engagement of Palermo in this network, it mostly took place I mean, it was mostly, uh, yeah, let's say it took place in, uh, in the national and uh, international debate rather than the local one. So uh, it is interesting to see, for example, the, the coverage at the, the, the first uh, um, convention that was organized by From the City to the City and when IESH was launched in Palermo in 2021. So it had a wider uh, you know, national and international coverage rather than a local one. So the point is, I'm not sure whether there is an interest for, uh, for mayors, for cities to really make this uh, engagement visible in the, uh, in the local community. So if they are really talking to the local community or they're really, they're rather talking, you know, to, it, it's more a matter to gain visibility nationally and internationally. So, uh, it is a, a, a game played in, a, in, another, uh, in another arena. In terms of what, uh, what is the gain cities have, I think that uh, if we look at it, like in terms of ideological affinity, so I mean, in terms of what is the political orientation of, uh, of some of the city of the mayors involved, the gain is in terms of uh, we are providing, you know, we are, uh, defending a, 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 a political stance that is actually even hard to be to be seen in uh, progressive uh, national uh, political actors. Uh, I mean, if we look at uh, center-left governments across Europe, it, I mean, it's, it's hard to see uh, very progressive migration policies as the ones they are promoting. So if we look at it, it's, uh, uh, this could be uh, um, um, uh, um, an answer, uh, so to speak. Um, I think that it's uh, um, it's very interesting, and maybe it's uh, I mean I, I mentioned this very very quickly, but I think it's uh, one of the main aspects that could be uh, uh, developed in terms of uh, what city do and what the approach is. Is for those cities that uh, 
try to use this uh, um, engagement as a way to okay, let's talk about something else, but not about what we are doing at a local uh, at a local level. Um, I mean, this is said in very extreme terms, but in some cases, for example, there is this rhetoric of uh, uh, this public discourse of uh, okay, we are. Uh, experiencing big problems as a, a frontline city in managing migration. So uh, we have like too many people, we are overcrowded in our reception facilities here, so we need to change policies at an EU level. So it, it is not necessarily a progressive discourse, the one that is accompanying this uh, progressive policy that is uh, uh, that is pushed forward by the network. So I think it's very different. Uh, my understanding is that it's very different depending on the city and depending on the on the on the national context. I think that the variables in this sense are essentially three. So the political orientation of the of the municipality, the national context, and the whether the city is a frontline city or not. Because then this, it's not by chance that one of the um, wider engagement, I mean, one of the places, the, the, the countries in which there has been a wider engagement in, in this network is Germany. But it was this whole, um, um, the, the Zeebrücke initiative and uh, this, uh, this whole idea of, uh, okay, let's do our part because people you know, are dying at sea. Uh, situation is uh, unbearable in, uh, in rival cities in, in Southern Europe, so we can do our part. But then, the point is uh, how much of these came into the public debate of local cities in Germany and uh, how, I mean, how feasible is that? So I, I'm also wondering, uh, I, I mean, I, I realize I have more questions than answers to what you were saying, but I think it can also be productive somehow. But I'm also wondering how different the situation would be if there, 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 there were a concrete possibility of having this relocation system from Sicilian cities to Germany, for example. So I think in a way, it is also easier that there is um, you know, the, the political cost of saying, okay, we open our cities to uh, asylum seekers and migrant people in, uh, uh, in Sicily. It's easier to, to say for Germany, I mean, or whatever, I mean, uh, another city in another country that other than Italy, when you already know that uh, this, this is a, you know, political de declaration, but it would it it won't have any concrete consequence. Uh, so I, I think this is a, a third element, which is also also very important. So these are, uh, in a way, the you know some of the element uh, of uh, why I, I think cities engaged. Uh, I also think, and maybe I, I will stop there because I realize I then get lost in my answers. But um, one of the, of the Points is that uh, uh, I think the, the I, I looked a lot at the, the, this network uh, uh, building from a civil society perspective. I think that the city perspective is it can be developed more, and I think that uh, it can be developed also uh, along the the questions that you that you were asking because I found them like very interesting. So thanks. I just have a follow up on the what you mean by what you mean by frontline city because German cities might not have been in the front line in terms of say Mediterranean arrivals, but obviously in terms of Syrian arrivals and Ukrainian arrivals, uh, they receive considerably more displaced people than Sicilian cities. So is this I, I kind of try and understand a little bit that so would your research also be taken into account these other ex, uh, forms of quite large scale displacement, which perhaps affects the idea of where the front, well, what you refer to a front line is, and the kind of then, but perhaps more broadly than the idea of solidarity within this network, because the relocation seems to be based on solidarity towards Mediterranean cities uh, from, from quite a large number of German cities. And I suppose, you know, it, so it's really just to, to maybe clarify a little bit about how the displacement you're seeing in the Mediterranean relates to other forms of displacement that might have had different effects on some of the countries that you are studying and, and ideas of solidarity within your network. Yes, uh, I, I think um, one of the main uh, points of internal debate within From City to the City uh, is the Mediterranean-centric approach of the network. So 
which is also clear in terms of the organizations you, you, you see there. Uh, there has been uh, um, uh, an increased presence of uh, um, uh, Balkan-based organizations, especially you know, from the Croatian uh, Zagreb Solidarity City. Uh, the point is also in uh, yes in um, in my uh, in my approach I focus very much on the, on the Mediterranean uh, Sea and uh, the Ukrainian situation. I think I mean the problem is that this research was uh, in a way when I uh, collected my data etc. I mean the the Ukrainian crisis was at the beginning so. I think also today the situation would be uh, would be different uh, in terms of uh, the understanding of uh, how uh, I mean of what the frontline city is, uh, of course, connected to that. Uh, I would say that uh, um, the, the the understanding of frontline city is very much related to the to undocumented migration. So that's the the. The element somehow, which is which becomes relevant, and it's connected with the perception or the the fact. I mean, it depends on how we want to frame it. Of uh, undocumented perception of uh, uh, as something which is out of control. So instead of having uh, an organized uh, reception of uh, uh, asylum seekers, there is this undocumented migration, which then. It, also involves, uh, uh, of course, in most cases, asylum seeking, etc. But uh, it is uh, it is more uh, emergency based. I mean, it's, it's uh, the arrival of people in the southern coast of Italy. It's people rescuing the Mediterranean Sea. It's also, of course, uh, uh, movements in the, um, along the Balkan routes. And so, uh, it is not uh, when, when I. Uh, Speak about frontline cities. I'm. I don't have in mind. Uh, you know how many uh, um, asylum seekers, uh, uh, migrant people more broadly, live in a city. Or, uh, but also because if we if we use this approach, we we know, for example, that uh, you know uh, that the, the the numbers of asylum seekers in Italy, let alone cities, but in Italy, the country in itself, I mean, is very low compared to to other European countries such as Germany. Uh, but uh, so it's it's more how exposed uh, uh, cities are to uh, sudden and uh, allegedly out of control uh, inflows of uh, of people. So in, in that sense, it's more in terms of emergency situations, structured emergency situation. I would say and that that is the difference. My understanding. I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, so, and, we, and we've uh, subjected Federica to quite an interaction already. So, uh, I'd like to say it's a really interesting research. I know it's part of a bigger project. It's going to develop and look more in more detail at civil society mobilization. So, it's uh, be good to keep in touch with that work. So, uh, from people in the room and people, well, uh, Thanks for attending. Also, those online who've joined us, thank you for joining us and uh, thank Federico for presenting to us. Thank you. <laughs>